Hello, everyone. Welcome to Transform Now. I'm Brad Hairston. And I'm Michael Marchuk. And this is our weekly pulse check, taking a look at what's in the news related to automation and AI. And Michael, we've got three interesting articles today to uh, to mull over. Let's start and I hear that uh, that first article is creating quite a buzz. <laughs> Yes, uh, no pun intended, or maybe you should what? say it pun was intended. intended. Um, so the first article comes to us from the New York Post, and it's titled "Amazon's Delivery Drones Become the Scourge of Texas Town." It sounds like a giant hive of bees, quote unquote. And Michael, I know last week we talked about an article that had ties to your college town. I think it was written by a professor from your alma yep. mater. This article actually ties to my college <laughs> because it, it, it takes place in College Station, Texas, uh, where I went to college. And um, it's an interesting article, though, because, you know, I remember, gosh, it was it was 11 years. No, yeah, 11 or 12 years ago when when uh, Jeff Bezos came forward and said, you know, we're going to have these drones delivering Amazon Prime packages. And I think he did it on 60 Minutes, if I'm not mistaken. And I remember everybody was going crazy over that. It's like, this is the coolest thing ever. Um, here we are, you know, 11, 12 years later. It hasn't happened. And so I, you know, I think this article kind of like you know, grab my attention because I, I was thinking about that. Um, but this is a interesting twist. They've been really testing hard in certain locations. And College Station is a community. They decided to do a, a you know, a test at scale. So we're talking hundreds of drones up in the air all at the same time. And they're testing out this capability to deliver a package within one hour of it being ordered online. So what did you think about the article and just kind of how the community in College Station is reacting? Well, I can certainly uh, empathize with them. And uh, this sounds like very much like an, uh, another article or story I read about the um, issues that like, Waymo was having in uh, California with some of their driverless cars. And this comes to the issue of scale and scaling up and the issues that perhaps you didn't consider when you're looking at things one at a time. Um, you know, AI is great. Um, all our automation stuff is great. And when you start doing things at scale and faster and faster, things look a little bit different than in the, the, the best, the, the best case scenario you look at for, as an engineer. And mm -hmm. when you start broadening these things out to scale, you, they come up with new challenges that they perhaps didn't even consider. So, um, certainly in this case here where the noise issues, uh, coming into play, uh, I can imagine if if people said, well, we want to do anything by, uh, by Harley Davidson motorcycle, because it'll be faster to get our, our packages out there. One at a time, people could understand, but if you had, like you said, 900 packages an hour going out or whatever the thing is, um, that would be a lot of noise from yeah. motorcycles. Um, and sure. so well, we need to do something about that, right? Yeah. Well, now we have these, these drones and inherently a single drone has a slight buzz to it. And they measured the, the, the decibels and said it was a small amount of noise. But when you have hundreds of them doing that every hour, going to and from the same location, um, I can see how the noise pollution part of that um, could be substantial. So yeah, this again comes back to as we adopt our technologies, looking at some of the unintended consequences that we may find out when we start doing things at scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's funny they chose a college town to test this out in. I guess because there's, there's, lots, because of, there's lots, lots of noise Amazon. already. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of Amazon Prime orders you know, being made by college students. Sure. But I don't think they counted on the citizens of the city being really bothered by the, the noise level, especially when you have that many taken off. What One more thing I'll point out. The article on uh, the New York Post had a little video showing the drones coming down and bringing the package. Did you see how it, it dropped it at about, it was probably 15 to 20 feet off the ground when it drops the package? And it hits the ground really hard. So that that's surprising that they would put that in their video. I'm, I'm thinking no one is going to want a product, you know, being treated <laughs> that way, especially anything fragile 
So well, they maybe may they've got to package solution. it differently for airborne delivery. You don't know. So there's yeah. a possibility that they are planning that into the packaging as they're as they're delivering it that way. Because Very also well, they have to be, think about some of those paper packages that you get um, that are protected inside of a van when they're driving around. Well, if you're driving, you're flying it through the air uh, through various weather conditions, perhaps um, they would need to use some other kind of packaging. Yep, yep. Well, our second article today is from Psychology Today, and it's titled The Great AI Detection Dilemma. Neither humans nor machines can reliably spot spot AI online. Does it really matter? This is talking about recent research that uncovered that neither humans nor AI are consistently able to detect AI generated content, which is pretty interesting to say the least. And, you know, it, it asked the question in the title, okay, if that's the case, does it really matter? What are your thoughts on this? Um, I would contend with no, it doesn't really matter uh, for a couple different reasons. Um, because let's put it this way, as we're using tools like spell check, for example, um, to support our writing, if mm -hmm. we took raw original documents that we would have to go back through and identify our spelling mistakes, um, we would spend a lot more time doing that. But the machines, as we're typing, are identifying or even correcting them on our behalf mm -hmm. uh, as we go forward. Uh, is that bad? Is that a bad thing that I'm sending out documents or emails that don't have spelling mistakes? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good thing. So right. when we start talking about identifying AI, specifically AI-generated content, yeah, in my mind, it comes into two different paths. One is the traditional work products that we're all used to. Does it matter if an, an email comes from uh, a, a generative AI component that sends out something for uh, thank you for your order or kind of thing mm -hmm. through email? You know, I would think it's probably pretty benign at that point. Where it may matter is, in fact, if you have news stories and or other aspects that are considered to be um, potentially inflammatory or mm -hmm. uh, misleading because AI generated, uh, you know, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump walking on a beach holding hands together uh, and smiling kind of thing. I, like those are the kind of weird stuff that's been generated. Mm -hmm. I, and I, obviously in these cases, it's, it's very obviously, you know, fake. But when you start getting to the next generation, the next generation where you know, literally you won't be able to tell if in fact that news conference is actually something that was filmed or if something mm -hmm. that was generated by AI, um, now you have a, a, a bigger issue. So uh, depending on how they um, they decide to, to move forward with any kind of governance or whatnot, the detection part of it, unless tools are put in place to specifically add some kind of watermark or something to do that, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that be, you'll be able to. Yeah. I'm not sure it will matter all that much only because I think the, the detection methods they're trying to use will be thwarted yeah. one way or another. Yeah. I mean, we all get form letters every single day, right? From businesses, from people. We've learned to kind of put up with that. Um, so I, I agree. I don't think it's going to matter that much. The, the only thing that would bother me, I think, is if someone was conversing with me and then I came to found, find out that I was conversing with an AI model that they put, they used as a proxy. And there's been talk about that as a future possibility. We might all have our own large language model. So you could essentially put a chat bot on, on top of that and say, hey, this person wants to chat with me. Go go talk to it and just be me for the next, you know, five minutes. Um, yeah, I'm not crazy about that. <laughs> and no. who knows if that would if that would even happen. Um, but uh, but it is it is interesting. I, I think uh this is something that comes up a lot about, you know, is it AI generated or human generated? And I think we're getting a little too high strung about it. Um, I think we'll all learn to deal with it over time. And what would happen in a false positive kind of scenario where like, no, I, I literally wrote that and I, some generative right. AI or AI somewhere said, no, that was all AI generated. And in reality, like, no, I actually did it. How do you, how do you <laughs> prove that you did it? That's right. That's right. So our last article is from Forbes and it's titled when automation and AI are better than people for software development. Uh, now this, this one's a little specific and it, you know, it's really kind of in the IT software dev 
realm. Um, we don't talk about automation and AI in the IT uh, function that much. So, um, so this one you know, I thought would be good, but but it also makes I think some pretty good points um, about automation being an effective guardrail to software that is getting, you know, software changes are getting deployed all the time. It's almost impossible for humans to inspect it in you know every piece of code every single day, twenty you know twenty four seven, and so automation in this world can really be effective at detecting when something's wrong before it goes out in mass and and creates uh you know some kind of major issue so what did you think about just the the points it's making around that and a, and a few other few other things well again the the article is about software deployment so looking at how these software and maybe even configuration changes are being sent out to devices again this gets back to the um the the quantity, the number of changes that we do, and also the scale at which those changes have to be deployed. So, for example, if you're AT&T, Verizon, uh, O2, anybody else, any of these large wireless carriers, they may have hundreds or thousands of uh, wire cell towers that have mm -hmm. equipment that have to have a change sent to. Well, what happens right. if that you send that change out, that configuration change, and it uh, it points to a non-existent uh, uh, area, and mm -hmm. so it now loses connection with those cell towers. Now you have potentially thousands of cell towers that would be now out of commission, and all of their service would be completely down um, because of a simple check that was missed. So mm -hmm. going back to my earlier discussion about uh, spell check, these are things that are put in place to support and prevent us from making those kinds of easy easy changes or easy fixes uh, that may not necessarily be accurate because we are doing them so quickly. So I think from a software deployment perspective, it's a it's a perfect way to do the checks and balances as things go out. Mm -hmm. But it also highlights another kind of um, kind of change or uh, a viewpoint difference that we start moving into as we look at uh, sort of AI agents and other agents. This whole concept of agency. Um, by software, where we have perhaps a hierarchy where the changes are being made once deployed by some software, checked by some other types of software to validate those changes are okay, and then finally, um, you know, uh, send out to the field uh, because now they've gone through several sets of checks to validate. In fact, those other checks may not necessarily know what the changes are, but they may check check for potentially harmful changes, kind of like a say, mm -hmm. antivirus, but something along those lines where it's validating that the configuration changes and software changes won't necessarily cause um, a dramatic impact other than the one that was expected for that particular piece of software. So it's a good way of doing yeah. the checks and balances built into that. But as we talked about even in the first article, when you start doing these things at scale, it really makes a big difference because one change could do could be devastating to your business. As we mm -hmm. saw just a little while ago was sort of that CrowdStrike um, issue they had with uh, the airlines and whatnot, where one yeah. configuration change, you know, costs billions of dollars of damage across a number mm -hmm. of different environments. So it's not just hypothetical. This is actually right potential, and we've seen it happen. Yeah, yeah. I thought about AI as well when this when I read this article, and and you know the conversation we're having with customers uh, almost every day about how can they safely provision Gen AI uh, in, in some cases hundreds of times a day in the in the course of a, of a process automation. And that's a, another great example of where you need automation to to log and track and audit and maybe review the outputs that are coming from Gen AI before they go to a customer or go to a supplier. Um, exactly. or, or go into a document and and you can use human in the loop to a degree but for some of these automations that we've seen customers you know wanting to do with gen ai it, it's going to be almost impossible for humans to look at every every piece of that so um yeah i i think i think digital workers uh, are part of the solution here um, as the article said automation begets automation i agree with that um and uh, I think it's it's a really good use case for sure. I agree. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you for joining us uh, to talk about the news. Uh, be sure and listen to our other podcast that we publish each week featuring 
a tremendous uh, guest. And uh, we will see you next time. Bye for now.